Hey everybody, welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. My name is Claire Shorenstein and I am a board certified sports dietitian and endurance athlete. I provide virtual nutrition services through my private practice, Eat for Endurance, and I host this podcast because I love to share the nutrition stories of both professional and recreational athletes, and I also enjoy teaming up with my sports dietitian colleagues to discuss a variety of important topics. Today, I'm really excited to have sports dietitian Brooke Zarnecki of Intentful Nutrition on the podcast to help me answer a listener question that came from my Patreon community. This runner asked to learn more about organic foods as an athlete and And in her message, she also mentioned that she tries to minimize processed foods surrounding her run. Her message inspired me to do an episode all about organic versus conventional foods and products, as well as processed versus less processed foods, especially for athletes. And we're going to throw a little GMO conversation in there while we're at it because it's related and also why not? There is a lot of confusion, fear-mongering, and extremism when it comes to this topic, and people have some really, really strong beliefs specifically uh, and opinions, specifically when it comes to organic GMO and processed foods. I'm sure you guys have all encountered this. I know I have everywhere. Um, And in this episode, we're going to start out by going back to the basics and defining what these terms actually mean. We're going to differentiate between opinion and science. Uh, We're going to also point out where marketing comes in uh, as well, just so you can make more informed decisions for yourself. And then we're going to talk about how this all applies to you as an athlete, including food decisions you may make in your everyday eating, as well as before, during, and after exercise. I want to say that this conversation, just talking about these these words, these topics, it's very complicated and and nuanced. And and we mentioned that in this show. And, you know, Brooke and I really did our best to hit the main points. And I really hope that it helps to guide you when you are choosing your own foods and products. I want to emphasize our overarching message that at the end of the day, the the best decision is the one that works best for you. There is nothing wrong with buying organic or minimally processed or non-GMO foods, obviously, but there's also nothing wrong with buying conventional foods or more processed foods or GMO foods. It's really all about the bigger picture. It's all about context. I say this all the time Um, and really falling into the trap of black and white thinking um, really will get you into trouble and not be a great way of living your life, in my opinion. Um, Anyways, before we dive in, I want to read a fan mail that I received recently from a listener out of Ithaca, New York. Fan mail, by the way, it's a new feature on my podcast hosting site, Buzzsprout, where you can literally text message me um, directly from the episode. And since I learned I can't respond directly to these messages, unfortunately, I thought it would be fun to read any that I get out loud on future shows. So here is a slightly condensed version of this wonderful message I got from a listener. She says, I just listened to the episode on body image and I couldn't relate to something more. I have always hated how my legs look because my calves and thighs are not small. I'm a small person and runner. I'm not skinny in my eyes, but I'm strong and I get a lot of compliments on my physique. It sounds so weird to say that. I'm almost 42 and I have five kids that I had all in five years. So my body isn't what it was when it started. My oldest is 18 and then I have 16 and 14 year old sons and 12 and 11 year old daughters. We are all athletic. My oldest three all love to lift weights and play a lot of sports. They are so jealous of my calves and quads. My whole life, I felt uncomfortable about the muscle in my legs and my kids see me as this super strong athlete. Sometimes seeing yourself through the eyes of someone who loves you can really help you see yourself truly. I love all your episodes and I look forward to them always. Thank you for all your awesome advice. I absolutely love this message. And if you're listening right now, the person who wrote this, thank you so much for sending it. I love hearing from you guys. And holy crap, five years, five kids in five years. Like, I don't know how you did that. That is an athletic feat in itself. I could barely handle two kids in two and a half years. So more power to you. Um, and yeah, so that was fan mail for today. If you'd like to send me a message, um, or write a review or anything, I love hearing from you guys. You can also email me if you don't want to do the fan mail thing. All right. So who is ready for today's episode? I definitely am. And I really hope you enjoy this chat that I had with sports dietitian, Brooke Zarnecki, all about organic processed and GMO foods. Brooke, how's it going? Welcome to the Eat for Endurance podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's going good here. Nothing crazy, just hanging out. <laughs> yeah, and you're in Kentucky, right? Yes, ma'am. You're in. But Kentucky. you were living in Alaska, or you, I know you've kind of lived all about. So tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah. So we, we're a military family. My husband is in the military. Um, so we're kind of, we beep up all around, but we've lived in Georgia. We've lived in Alaska. That Alaska is where we have been for the longest, which is so crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, then we were in Missouri for a little bit now, Kentucky, and now, uh, in a couple months, we'll be moving to Virginia, which Virginia will be oh. our third move in three years, which is so crazy. Wow. With yeah. a little one too. That's yes. no easy feat. <laughs> Yeah. So we're a little, it's like controlled chaos. We were supposed to be in Kentucky for a lot longer, but, um, you know, the military works in that way where sometimes you just have to leave early. So yep. <laughs> that's where we yep. are. Yep. <laughs> and, and that's the beauty of being a virtual dietitian is you can kind of, I mean, not that it's easy, but you can kind of take your work with you, which, um, I know we both, you know, share that. Um, so yeah, before we dive into today's topic, I always like my dietitian guests to share their background on themselves, both as a dietitian and as an athlete as well. Yeah. So, oh gosh, what, what will I share first? I will just kind of talk about my story a little bit. Um, I originally wanted to be a dietitian to help people lose weight and get healthy and, um, essentially like combat the quote unquote obesity epidemic and all that good stuff. Um, And then I went to school and I realized, like, I really want to help people have a very healthy relationship with food instead. Um, I had a lot of disordered eating growing up, like in middle school and high school into college. I was also a collegiate athlete myself. And like I said, I really struggled with my relationship with food for a long time. And I think like a lot of dietitians, I think we go into this field with disordered eating habits and then you know, realize as we go through school, like, oh, dang, (laughs) Um, my issues with food, I have brought into my like passion for and drive to study Mm -hmm. nutrition. Mm -hmm. Um, So through school, really into my internship year, like post college, I realized like my relationship with food was a problem and probably held me back with athletics. Um, I definitely think I struggled with under fueling and chronic reds for years, Um, always having injuries, like just so moody all the time, so tired, fatigued, just, you know, burned out all the time as an athlete, as a student athlete. Um, And so it wasn't until like my internship year where I was injured that I realized like, I am very restrictive with my food habits. And so I discovered intuitive eating and never really looked back since then. I, it's funny though, because I don't really say that I'm an intuitive eating dietitian because I think that there's a lot of stigma around intuitive eating for some reason. Um, Is there? I feel like there is. I've had so many athletes come to me and say, I don't want to be an intuitive eater or like the intuitive eating. They say like the intuitive eating world seems really, I don't know if the right word is like hostile, but judgmental. Mm. Um, of like, if you do this, you're not an intuitive eater. It's like very black and white. Yeah. Um, and so I try to meet people in the middle of like, okay, a lot of my practice is founded in intuitive eating principles, but if we don't want to have the label, that's totally fine. Um, so I do integrate a lot of intuitive eating principles into my practice, but, um, like everybody, there's a time and place to be an intuitive eater. I think some people need a little bit more structure at first and then they move into intuitive eating. So anyway. I'm all over the place right now. Um, but that's a little bit about like my path, my story, um, and how I came to be a dietitian, I guess. And, you know, at first I didn't really want to work with athletes, um, but I've always been an athlete myself. And I You're think a runner, was, right? Yeah, always a runner. Yeah, mm-hmm. like ran through middle school, high school, college. I was a D3 athlete, ran cross country and track in college, um, was the captain of my team senior years, like one of the best experiences ever of my life. Um, and, but I was like, I don't want to work with athletes. I don't know why when I first started, but here I am now today. It's, I love doing it. And, um, you know, I'm just very passionate about helping people prevent under fueling, prevent reds, and really just see the light when it comes to nutrition and have, you know, fears or not have fears and really just follow the science and follow the facts. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing all of that. And yeah, I mean, a lot of that resonates with me. Um, I mean, I've been very open about my own story as well. And I agree. I mean, a lot of so many, not all dietitians, but a lot of dietitians um, either have a history of disordered eating or eating disorders or 
you know, like for me, for instance, there were still remnants of disordered eating going even when I started my program, you know, and, yeah. and I started fairly late. And even though like a lot of it was behind me, it's just, it takes a long time to kind of let go of that. And I'm sure, I mean, I, I know it's very different now. Um, I mean, I've been a dietitian for gosh, over 10 years now. And, um, but so I know it's different, like things are changing, but back when I was in school, a lot of what we learned was very much reinforcing a lot of the disordered eating, like kind of that normalized uh, totally. stuff. Um, and it really was not helpful. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, thankfully I, I, I know I kind of got, got over all of that and did work to kind of help myself with all that stuff. But, um, it's interesting just hearing other dietitians' experiences with that, and and in in terms of the intuitive eating thing, yeah, I'm I'm the same way. Um, there are elements of intuitive eating that I work into my practice. I don't really define myself as much of anything. I kind of yeah. am in that gray space of nuance. That's always uh, that's my preferred space, which I think is a great space to be in because nutrition is all about nuance and gray spaces. <laughs> so, uh, and that's really where we, you know, sit in, in this podcast as well as just exploring all these different things, um, and seeing, you know, different people's approaches and whatnot. So, um, well with that, you know, out of the way, and as a background, um, we're going to go into today's topic. Um, I'm excited about this one because it was actually brought up by a listener as a listener topic request, um, but it's something that I think is, you know, a lot of people are confused by and wonder about. Um, and it's basically relating to the types of foods that we eat and the food decisions that we make as athletes. And I'm just going to read the message that I received to give it context, and then we can, <laughs> we can go into it. So this listener said, I'd love to learn more about organic foods and running. I've heard on previous episodes how you should just get used to eating the graham crackers, chips, and other processed foods, but I try hard to avoid these things and plan my drop bags with fewer processed foods. I don't really use organic gels, chews, et cetera, so I try to make my breads and snacks as simple and as healthy as possible. All right. So we could go in so many different directions with this message. Like I can think of like a hundred topics to like <laughs> dive into just from that message. Um, and we'll definitely be going into several topics today, but the, what I basically distilled from this and what we're going to touch, we're going to really like focus on is the discussion about organic versus conventional foods, processed versus unprocessed foods. However, we're defining those things. And then we're throwing GMOs into the mix because that's all relevant. And so many people talk about these things. So I think the first thing that would be helpful is to define these terms and dispel some myths because it seems that the general assumption is that organic is best, processed foods and GMOs are bad, right? So I think, would you agree with that? That's kind of like the general, like, like yes, okay, conventional produce is fine, but organic must be better, right? That's yes. kind of yes. the general assumption. And like, what what is that even based off of? Well, it's based off of a lot of you know, information we consume all over the place. So let's start with organic versus conventional foods. Can you explain what organic actually means just to yes. make it really crystal clear? Yeah. And before we jump into this, I do want to, I didn't say this part about my background, but um, I did work on a small farm for six years throughout my years in high school. I was a farm hand. So <laughs> I milked cows, they grew produce, they sold their produce. So I do have a little bit of like personal experience in this realm. And then um, in college, I worked for Wegmans in the labeling department as a, a nutrition intern. So I did a lot of work awesome. with the labeling team and um, helped them, you know, basically vet their labels and make sure that what we were giving to consumers was accurate information, which is a lot of fun. Still like one of my favorite jobs ever. I would go back there and work for them in a heartbeat. Um, awesome. So organic foods. And I'm going to read some things like from websites just so that I'm not fumbling over my words, but certified mm -hmm. organic ingredients. And we can talk about like the different levels of labeling of organic products. If there is a certified organic ingredient in your food, basically a certified organic ingredient means it's produced without synthetic and most, I will say most, produced without most synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. So that means that some organic products will be produced with synthetic fertilizers and pesticides if they are approved. So that's like a huge loophole already in the organic label. Um, it's produced without GMOs. 
no bioengineering, no ionizing radiation, and no antibiotics or growth hormones for your meat products and your poultry products. Um, that's a very generic definition right off the bat. And, you know, we can talk about like produce versus meat because there's different distinctions there and how the conventional label or the, how the organic label is used and how the conventional piece would come into play there. Um, but at the end of the day, if a farmer is a organic farm or they have the organic certification, it means they have gone through the process to become certified, which means they have gone through an application fee, a renewal fee, um, assessment on sales and inspection fees every year. So it's a process to become a certified organic farm to then produce certified organic ingredients. Um, and a lot of like small farms can't afford this. So this is, you're going to hear me say this a lot. Like I think as a consumer, if you care about where your food comes from, like understand where your food comes from, visit local farms, um, go to like your local uh, farmer's market and ask people questions about how their food is produced because not all small farms are going to have like quote unquote certified organic products, but they're going to be using organic practices, if that makes sense. Um, so to go back to the label and understand like what is on our food label, there's four different categories that you will see or that the USDA is regulates. So if you see something and you probably all understand or have seen the organic seal on something, it'll say like USDA organic. Um, I think it's green. I don't know why I'm blanking on what that, that seal looks like. Um, but if something is 100% organic, that means 100% of the ingredients in that product are organic, which we've explained already about like what a certified organic ingredient is. So this is a good example of like strawberries or something probably going to be hundred percent organic because it's just one ingredient, right? Now you can have something that's 95% organic and this will still have the organic seal on it. Like the hundred percent organic product will, but up to 5% of the ingredients can be produced without the, um, without organic, the certified organic ingredients. This is so crazy. Like all of the same things I'm repeating over and over again. So we can ask, we can do some clarification after this. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third category is made with organic. So that's something that contains at least 70% of certified organic ingredients. And this is something that won't have the seal, the organic seal, but you might see on the product, like made with organic ingredients on like the front of the label. So up to 30% of that product can be a conventionally produced or non-organic item in the food. Um, and then specific, the last category is specific organic ingredients. So this will not have the seal, uh, the made with organic, I think I said, will not have the seal as well. Um, mm -hmm. And the specific organic ingredient cannot say on the front of the label, like made with organic, it will just specify in the ingredient list if it's made with an organic cane sugar, for example, or something like that. Um, so four different categories as you're looking at your label and trying to understand what the heck it means. It's very like complex and nuanced already. And we're like, what, not even 10 minutes into our conversation. So mm -hmm. just have the understanding to know that just because something says organic, like there's different layers to it and there's different levels to it. Yeah. And, and to also differentiate between like, these are labeling practices. It's different than marketing terms. Yes. Like, like, correct me if I'm wrong, I could be wrong here, but all like all natural is not like, that's a marketing term. Correct. 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 All yeah. natural has no regulation. No meaning. It, no it has no meaning. <laughs> it right. means nothing. Just ignore. <laughs> yes. It's just something to get you to buy their product. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about organic in the stamp in the seal. Um, honestly, the organic seal is probably one of the most regulated seals out there or labels out there. Um, I know that we're going to get into the GMO thing and mm -hmm. like, you know, even the all natural thing. It's like those things are not regulated by like established, you know, I guess established, what is the word I'm looking for? Like regulated bodies. Yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> okay. So we've defined what organic is and 
we're going to get into that loophole, that pesticide loophole a little bit more. Um, but I guess let's, let's kind of take this and dive a little bit deeper in that, that whole assumption of organic equals better. So I think, you know, we already pointed out, you already pointed out that small, like not everyone can affirm these regulations, I mean, these certifications. Um, and, you know, yeah, think about all of the small farms, think about, um, you know, I think of actually there's a strawberry guy, like just on the side of our road and he's always like, I mean, I know it comes from like a lot, a local small farm and he's always like, it's organic, you know? And it's like, you think about it, it's like, he means like it's organic, like it's grown with minimal pesticides or whatever, but like, yes. it doesn't have a seal on it. It's just like, you know, yes. local strawberries. Um, but I really liked what you said about, you know, if you care about the quality of your food and where it comes from and supporting local farms and buying local and all that things. And those are all things you can do and it may or may not be labeled as organic. Um, so I think it's more about, again, if you care about these things, then just in doing a little bit of investigation and maybe it's supporting some local farms and maybe it is buying things from a farmer's market versus always from a big grocery store or whatever. Not that you have to do those things. We're not saying exactly. you have to do those things. It's just that if you care about that and you want to. Um, and so the other piece is, okay, well, organic, not always, but usually almost always is more expensive. Once in a mm -hmm. while, you'll come across a sale or just whatever, something is less expensive. Again, we're talking mostly grocery store things here. Um, and, you know, when, the, the question of, okay, well, when should we, if ever, go out of our way to buy organic? I think that's really like the crux of this is like, okay, is organic actually better? <laughs> My answer is it depends what you, what you're looking at. Right. I think what I tell my clients most of the time is no, it really doesn't matter. Again, from a nutritional standpoint, I'm not talking about like from like a crop rotation standpoint or how the actual crop or animal is being raised or grown. Right. Um, I'm talking from a nutritional standpoint, strictly, it really doesn't matter if you're buying organic versus conventional. Now, I will say some people tell me they like the taste of organic berries better or organic bananas better or organic meat better. Fine. If you can afford it, buy it. Um, but the the really big message here too today is like, don't buy organic because you feel like you have to if you can't afford it. Like if you're, you know, pinching pennies to put food on your table, it's really not necessary to buy organic over conventional. It's from, again, from a nutritional standpoint, it's really not much of a difference at all. Um, but some people do prefer the taste. So what if, what if you can afford it? Should you bother? Is it worth it? Let's say you can afford it, but meh, you know, you're kind of trying to figure out what's best for your, yourself and your family or whatever. I personally don't buy organic produce. If that means anything to anybody as, yeah, as I don't a either. <laughs> um, some people do really care about the pesticides that are used on their, on their food. And so they prefer to, to buy organic knowing that there is maybe potentially some pesticides used on their organic produce. Again, I think it's a total personal preference. I don't think it makes you morally superior if you're buying organic produce, but if you care about maybe crop rotation or, you know, like how the crop is being produced or you care about how the animal is being raised, um, then yeah, like buy organic. Um, but again, you don't have to, it doesn't make it a like automatically better product or better food. Um, but the way that a crop and or an animal is raised is a little bit different if they have an organic label on them, if that makes sense. How is it, how is it different? So, okay, well, actually, let's dig into that for a minute. The, the whole am antibiotics and mm -hmm. growth hormone. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about any health impacts or impacts to the animal. Like maybe let's explore that briefly. Um, yeah. Just to help listeners kind of make that decision. <laughs> totally. Totally. So Gosh, the or the pesticide or not? Sorry, not the pesticide. The hormone thing is a bunch of BS, to be honest. And the, the antibiotic thing is a bunch of BS. So, in order to be considered an organic, um, like an organic chicken or organic beef or something like that, the animal has to not be treated with 
antibiotics ever throughout their life, which from my experience working on the farm, if an animal was sick and they needed antibiotics, we would give them antibiotics. But if it was an organic farm, they could give them antibiotics, but then that, that animal would no longer be considered an organic animal. So they would either have to sell it as like, they would go to a different um, facility to be butchered or whatever. Like, honestly, I don't know mm -hmm. what would have happened with them, but they wouldn't have been able to be used to make money again, I guess, for the organic label. Um, but to go back to my point about, okay, so let's say our dairy cow needed antibiotics. We'd give them the antibiotics, but then we wouldn't milk, like we would milk them, but they, it wouldn't go into the batch of milk that would be sent off to the grocery store. Like they would be separated from the rest of the herd Got and it. they would be until they were better and off antibiotics, then thrown back into the mix. And then they would be, you know, milked. And then that milk would be used in a grocery store. So that label means absolutely nothing because the animal that's being treated with antibiotics would not be gone off to the butcher with antibiotics in their system. It wouldn't be gone to, you know, the dairy processing facility, the milk processing facility with antibiotics in the milk. Like the animal is treated, it's taken away from, you know, the milk production or whatever, the milk, the milking process, and then it'd be added back into the herd. Is so that like, standard practice? Like I have, I, I literally have no idea. So because do you know that's standard practice to take it like for all farms? Experience, from my personal experience, yes, that is that is standard okay. practice. I worked at a small farm in upstate New York. I can't say the mm. same thing for other farms, but mm. that was our practice. And that is when I've talked to other farmers, when I follow other farmers on Instagram and things like that, because their messaging is to like help kind of break down this stuff, the labeling, mm -hmm. they say the same thing. Like if the animal is treated with antibiotics, it's not then used to go to the consumer during the treatment time period. Um, mm -hmm. So, so just so just to clarify what you're saying then is that the antibiotic stuff is BS mostly because if an animal is treated, they're you know they're not immediately going to be butchered or immediately being milked, and that is not being passed on to the consumer. Yes. Okay. What about growth hormone? Um, I don't think any like most farms that I was familiar with in upstate New York did not use growth hormones in general. Like, I think that's a very outdated practice. I don't. And in big I can, farms too? I would have to look that up because I don't, I'm yeah. not actually sure not on the sure. growth hormone piece. Um, but yeah, that would be something I'd have to clarify with with the the current practices and the research. But and I know that small yeah. farmers really don't use the growth yeah, hormones. Yeah, because I mean, mostly what I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about your gen, your average consumer who's going to Costco or like big box kind of grocery stores and things like, you know, foster farms and like, you know, all those like really, really big farms. Um, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Or even Trader Joe's, like, I don't, I don't actually know where that meat comes from. You know, just yeah. thinking about these kinds of stores and, you know, again, it's like, I mean, you go in there and you look at the things and there's organic and non-organic versions of almost everything, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's vegetables, fruits, I mean, Jesus, like body products, <laughs> like, it's like literally, literally everything, literally everything, pasta, like you name it. And, and then you're looking at the prices and of course, pricing right now is really hard for everybody You know, inflation is just really rough and, and, and food costs are high. And you know, so you look at this stuff and, and I'm sure there are people out there looking at these things and being like, okay, well, I don't want to have a, my grocery bill be even higher, but I also want to make the healthiest choice for my family. And so again, you kind of revert back to this, like, oh, well, this must be better. So um, I think, I think what we're trying to get at here is we're trying to dispel the myth that organic is automatically better or healthier. That's really the overarching message. It's not that, you know, if you want to eat organic, like go for it. There's no, there's no harm in doing that. No one's, we're not telling you not to do that. I just really want to make sure that people are not feeling bad or guilty or they're not purchasing something because it's not organic or equally that they're not kind of like, and this is what I see all the time. I'm sure you see it too. Like people are like, oh, this is such a great thing and it's organic. And it's like, okay, well, cool. Great. <laughs> So, um, yeah. Um, and actually maybe this is a great point for me to jump in, um, about the environmental working groups, dirty dozen list. Um, they have a, what's it? Clean 15 and dirty dozen. I mean, we mm -hmm. learned, I mean, I don't know about you, but this is something that we were taught in school. Yeah. Us um, too. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like as a dietitian, you know, a new dietitian, whatever we were taught this. Um, and, but we weren't really taught again, the nuances behind this thing. So, um, the environmental working groups, dirty dozen, it's a great example of essentially fear mongering because that's what a lot of the stuff surrounding (laughs) organic is. It's a lot of fear mongering into thinking that we should never eat conventional produce. Um, and, I think the thing to note, it's going back to that loophole you mentioned. I and this might just be, you know, lack of knowledge or misinformation or whatever, but people seem to believe that because something is organic, that means there are zero pesticides, that no pesticides are used, and that's not true. There are still pesticide residues on your food. Mm-hmm. But the thing to remember is just because a pesticide residue is present on a fruit or vegetable or whatever, it doesn't mean it's harmful. We always have to separate the mere presence of something from how much. So we always have to remember dose response, like what is an unsafe level? And in most cases, and this is also the case when we look back at like, um, you know, certain fake sugars and, you know, things like that. It's like most cases, the amount you would need to be unsafe is so dramatically high compared to what you would actually consume in the food that it's kind of irrelevant. So, um, so I think it's, again, it's, it's remembering that the, the presence of a, of, of a pesticide residue on say an apple or whatever, um, doesn't indicate like danger. And Mm -hmm. you also have to remember that you can wash that. You can wash it with um, water. Don't use soap or anything, but you can wash it with water that will remove some of it. Um, I think another important thing to think about, I mean, there are a lot of toxins entering our body and depending on if you're in the functional space or not, that's like a whole other separate conversation about how much toxins our body can handle but we we our body is capable of getting rid of waste products so um you know if a little bit of a residue enters let's again emphasize not at unsafe levels let's say some at a quote unquote safe level enters your body your body should be able to get rid of that in theory right so mm-hmm. there's that um the other thing about the environmental working group is they're not like Okay, there's like they're like oh the dirty dozen the clean fifteen they're like pointing to all of the problems with you know supposedly these top twelve or actually it's more than twelve they say dirty dozen but it's like way more it's a longer list um, but they don't actually sit there and then point out like all of the residues that are on the supposedly clean products and not to mention I'm going on a little bit of rant now not to mention. <laughs> <laughs> the word clean, like clean and dirty with food is like, come on, come on, guys. Again, like 2024 regulated. is 2024. Yeah. Like, again, going back to like fear mongering and just really like embracing the language that we hate. So, um, so yeah, so like rather than just encouraging people to eat more plant foods, like they're basically just like shaming and guilt tripping people and making them anxious about eating conventional produce. So yeah. That's kind think, of where I stand there. And I think too, with like the, the dirty dozen thing is just because something has a lot of residues on it, doesn't mean, again, like you're saying, doesn't mean that the, the dose is like going to poison you in some way. Exactly. Like, it doesn't mean that the more residues equals bad. Like they, again, how the, and this is something else too to mention is like organic produce oftentimes is extremely difficult to to produce like a perfect product, quote unquote. And so Mm -hmm. it's very expensive to run these farms um, and then then get it to the consumer, right? So you'll often see that like organic um, crops, and this is, again, we're talking mostly about crops here. Like there's a whole nother side of this too, but they're very imperfect. And so like, there's a reason sometimes that some of these things have pesticides or they have um, an herbicide or whatever it is to protect that plant from pests. Um, so it's not like these things are not always bad. Um, they can oftentimes be helpful for crop production and then to get you a cheaper product. Like that's the whole point. Um, so, you know, that's another, that's another side of this too, is that oftentimes it doesn't just because a pesticide is used, doesn't mean it's a hundred percent a bad thing. Like yeah, there for a reason. Um, and I do think that sometimes consumers assume 
that were just out here. And again, I don't know what the practices are on these big farms. I would love, I don't mean, they probably don't have visitors, but I would love to visit one of these big farms and just understand like their processes. Um, because our process on a smaller, more local farm, and of course, I'm just talking about my personal experience on a smaller farm. And I did visit other farms in upstate New York that practice similar things. They only spray if it's necessary. So it's not like, you know, all these farms are out here just spraying for fun. Like they're expensive too. Pesticides aren't like, they're not free. Like, like people are running around spraying pesticides for fun, as you said. Yeah. It's a cost. Yes. And also just because an organic pesticide is used doesn't necessarily mean it's less toxic or, you know, less harmful. Like it's just, it's just organic. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, yeah. And, and, and in terms of like organic, like other things like pastas or, I don't know, skincare. I mean, she mentioned, the listener mentioned organic gels and shoes. I don't even, I mean, I'm sure that exists. I'm sure that actually they're labeling that says things are organic, but all to say, I would definitely, that's not something I would ever be looking for in mm-hmm. my sports nutrition product. Don't even bother with that. No. First of all, sports nutrition is expensive enough as it is. I think an organic kind of label on that kind of thing, um, it's just not necessary. So, um, that's I don't yeah, even know what, that's like t- how it would be organic. Well, because like let's let's say you're doing um some sports nutrition that is using I don't know a fruit or oh, I see. you know what okay. I mean um like any kind of more quote unquote real food based gel or maybe it's a bar or whatever uh-huh. um maybe something's using a juice or some fruit product um that would be when I mean again it doesn't mean it's bad if. <laughs> But if I'm like, what do I need in order, like my criteria for a sports nutrition product, it's definitely organic is like not on that list. <laughs> it's yeah, like, hmm, it might... let's make sure it doesn't, it has like carbs and sodium and to the basics yeah. basically. Yeah. And it might go back to like the nuance of the label and the, the four different mm. categories of the made with organic ingredients. I don't give a shit about made with organic ingredients, to be honest. Yeah. 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 Totally. <laughs> like... um, okay. So, so Yeah. So wrapping, wrapping the organic versus conventional thing up, um, I, yeah, we are definitely like, we support you if you want organic, like go for it, you do your thing. Um, but if you kind of, you're, you don't like, I think where a lot of people fall is, um, you know, maybe they don't care either way. They just want to do the thing that's best or, or they think is best or whatever. Like, please don't fall into the trap of thinking that organic is superior and you must buy organic and blah, blah, blah. Cause that's really where a lot of people fall into. And I hear all the time. Um, and really it's, at the end of the day, it's a personal choice, but, um, but do understand that there's a lot of marketing going on. There's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding, um, I, the only thing I'll say is we maybe haven't completely told the whole story surrounding more like big farming practices, Mm -hmm. but I do think for the most part, what we're talking about applies. So, um, so yeah, anything else to add to organic discussion? No, I I think, I think I had something, but it's gone. So I I think I'm good on that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And then with perform yeah, and then with performance nutrition, like just don't worry about it. Do not worry about organic. If this is a concern, like please don't don't stress about organic and sports yeah. nutrition. Um, okay. We might revisit organic if other things come up, but we're gonna put that on the shelf for now. We are gonna move on to processed foods. That is like a whole big topic in itself. <laughs> yeah. Um and I'm going to just divide this category um, up into unprocessed, minimally to moderately processed and ultra processed or UPFs, we can say. Um, I I mean, those aren't like technical terms or like official terms or anything. I'm just kind of putting it in these categories because people throw around the term processed a lot. And I think when people say the word process, they usually mean ultra processed Mm -hmm. um, because because obviously like nearly everything we eat is processed to some degree. Right. So they're not meaning like, oh, yes, that that dry brown rice in the bag. It's so, you know, it's so overly (laughs) processed. You know what I mean? Like that's usually not what they're talking about. They're talking about the bag of Cheetos or whatever. Right. So um, I think we'll just put that out there. I also want to say before we kind of move into this discussion that it's a very nuanced discussion, like 
even totally. more so, I think, than organic. hundred percent. Um, uh, you know, I think th there's no clear definitions here about what these things are. A lot of people, um, it's kind of when people say, well, maybe not like, like plant-based, but you know, it's like, like people say a term and then other people kind of think they're meaning, there's no like clear thing here. I think a lot of people get confused. Um, and, and we have to also consider like, why are people eating or overeating UPFs, ultra processed, processed foods, you know? So um, is it the fact that it's very palatable and it's it's easy to overconsume these things? Is it for socioeconomic reasons? We have to kind of keep that in mind that, again, not everyone can afford organic, minimally processed foods. Um, so why are these people, why are people reaching for these foods? Um, and then lastly, whenever we talk about processed foods, like with the kind of the clean and the dirty discussion, we have to think about, you know, eating disorders and disordered eating in that whole world, because um, if we're harping on like processed stuff all the time, avoiding these things, this and that, it really just adds more fuel to the fire in terms of, um, you know, anxiety and shame and guilt and fear mm -hmm. and all that stuff, especially in people who already have a lot of issues and struggles surrounding food. So that's kind of the backdrop. <laughs> <laughs> for love, processed that's foods. Great, yes, that's a great backdrop. I love that. Um, so, yeah. So um, I think the last thing I want to say before I turn it over to you is um, just like I was saying, like organic is assumed as good and whatever. We have to remember that all processed foods, no matter like how processed they are, these foods in themselves are not inherently bad. Mm -hmm. um, and that might sound like people will definitely in discreet with me there you know like oh, yeah. how can you yeah. say that a snickers bar isn't bad you know what i mean like okay there there truly is a place for all of these foods somewhere in the diet it's so the snickers bar or the cheeto or whatever we're talking about here is not in itself bad it's how frequent how much you know like what's the context we talk about context all the time what's the bigger picture of your overall mm -hmm. health your diet, what you're doing, your movement, like what else is going on? So again, we have to really take the big picture in mind and the quantity and all of that, because obviously we're not going to sit here and be like, yeah, cool. Go eat, go out and eat ultra processed foods all day. That's my recommendation. You're going to be great and healthy. Like, obviously not. <laughs> That's not a recommendation anyone in their right mind would make. Um, but yeah, so this is where the nuance comes in. Um, but people are very much demonizing all processed foods. So, okay. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Processed foods, maybe how should we define this? Break it down. How should we approach this discussion? Hey, everybody. Sorry to interrupt the show, but I just wanted to come on and ask a quick favor. If you are enjoying this episode or if you've been a fan of the podcast ever or enjoyed other episodes, I would so appreciate it if you could share it with a friend. If wherever you're listening, Spotify, Pod, Apple Podcasts, wherever, if you could go and give me a five-star rating and even better, write a review sharing some of the things you enjoy about the podcast. That would be so, so awesome. I've had this show. It'll be five years in August. I'm still really trying to grow the show and keep it going. Um, and that will help with, you know, generating sponsored content and stuff like that, which I don't currently have. So if you could just help me out, that would be so lovely so I can keep this free content going for you guys. Um, also, you can... Uh, you know, enjoy any of my nutrition services elsewhere. I have additional free resources, whether it's my monthly newsletter, I have free digital downloads, I have low cost digital downloads, I have my course as well, Peak Performance for Endurance Athletes, which covers every day and performance nutrition over on my website. Um, and of course, if you're looking for nutrition uh, coaching, I have my one to one monthly programs. I am accepting new clients right now. And I'd love to hear from you guys. So you can go over to my website, eatforendurance.com. You can shoot me a message over at Claire at eatforendurance.com, um, whether it's about working together or again, if you'd like to just get in touch, if you'd like to make a top request, like this episode was inspired by, I would absolutely love to hear from you. All right, let's get back to the episode. Oh, it's such a tricky topic because I feel I like there's so much black and white thinking with it. And, mm -hmm. you know, my main population that I work with is uh, endurance athletes struggling with eating disorders and disordered eating. And so I'm oftentimes like telling them to go eat the Cheetos or go eat, you know, the, the ice cream that you haven't had in five years. Yeah. Um, you know, I just had a, a client recently 
you know, she swore off all sugar for 20 years. Um, and so she's like seeing life in a whole new way now. So it's like, what is the intention behind the action? Is this like rooted in fear and shame and guilt? Or is this, you know, I don't even want to say, is it like, again, it's such a, such a tricky conversation to have, but I always say, what is the intention behind your action? Is this something that's making you feel very negative? And so you're avoiding it because you're afraid of how you might feel, or are you avoiding it for something else? Maybe you're allergic to the food. Maybe it doesn't make your tummy feel good. Um, like what, what are we thinking about before we consume the product? And is this like, you know, is it fearful? I guess, I, I guess is the bottom line here. Um, because there is so much food, food and, and fear mongering around the products that we consume. And I just think it's way over dramatized on the internet, which most things are, because if it's not dramatized, then things don't sell your, you know, your supplements don't sell. But here's the thing that like really gets me is the same people that are peddling, like eat whole foods and don't do this. Like, I can't imagine eating, you know, I guess we're just going with the Cheeto example today. Like I would never buy the Cheetos off the shelf. But then over here, they're selling you like their pre-workout, you know, supplement line or like their protein powder supplement line. And I'm like, that that's processed too. Like, mm -hmm. no, yeah. that is also <laughs> produced in a lab. So yeah. what's the difference there? I think, you know, it's a lot of times it's the messaging around it um, and the marketing around it that is making someone either buy it and feel good about it or, you know, consume it and feel really bad about it. Um, I think at the end of the day, you have to just break down. And this is what I think is like, break down the food objectively rather than subjectively. So, um, you know, we're going with the Cheeto route again, but Cheetos are a carbohydrate. They've got carbs, carbs in them. It's primarily what they're made up and salt. of. And salt. <laughs> yes. And then, you know, I don't know, something else like an apple, also carbohydrates. So, you know, it, it's like, of course, it's not that simple, but it's oftentimes like, what else are you, are you having with the specific food item to make it? to make it more balanced, to make it more satiating. Um, and that's really what it comes down to in a lot of situations. In my experience is if somebody is having trouble with binge eating, um, overeating, of course, there's a lot of emotional things that can be behind this too, but what does the rest of your day look like? Um, you know, what's causing you to binge on that food? Oftentimes it's not about the food itself, but what's led up to that moment of maybe you didn't eat enough. Maybe you're telling yourself you can't have it. Maybe you haven't had it in 60 days because you're on a cleanse or, you know, whatever. There's so many other, gosh, this conversation could go literally in 5 million directions. I know. I know. And, and I want to bring it back to this listener question slash comment where, you know, she was asking, or she was saying you often, you know, that I'm often saying in these episodes, just eat the graham crackers, take the gels, do this and that. Um, and I'm not, you know, I want to be clear. I, again, I don't want to be invalidating anyone or just, first of all, I definitely don't want to be saying, oh, hey, this is really easy. I know sometimes this stuff is yeah. really hard for people. I mean, so like, we're even I definitely want to be talking about it. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't want people, you know, people who are struggling with sugar, with refined carbohydrates, whatever, with quote, unquote processed foods. I put in quotes again, because like, what's the definition here? Um, you know, people who are struggling, like it might be really hard for them to have the graham cracker, the pop tart, the whatever, right? I get that. Um, and, and what I'm trying to say is that these foods have a place. And when we're talking about, you know, sports nutrition specifically or intra-workout nutrition, so really like the before, the during, the after, um, you know, that's not the place to have an apple with all that fiber or a kale salad or things like that. There's a reason, there's a reason why that, why, you know, simpler carbs, easy to digest foods, um, not to say that there aren't unprocessed versions, like a banana is great. And they're all, and maybe people are doing a rice, but I mean, there are all kinds of things that are minimally processed that are lower fiber and can absolutely work. Um, and, 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 convenience foods are just that they're convenient and they're easy, to, easier to digest in some, you know, circumstances. And maybe you're up on a mountain and like, you know, you don't have the ability to, you know, like a banana is going to get smushed or something, you know, maybe it's you're in between aid stations, like whatever. So my point is that it's not an either or, right. You know, with this stuff, it's not a, 
um, I have to swear off all these things and can only have whole foods or minimally processed foods. And it's also not, I'm eating pop tarts 24 seven, you know, or Cheetos or whatever it is, you know, like, like, again, there is a place for all these things. And it's really complicated because it's so tied up in this world of food beliefs and fears and rules and, you know, what you're allowing yourself to have, what you believe about yourself and what, you know, is good or bad or whatever, using that, even the good and bad language, mm -hmm. um, rather than approaching food in a more neutral way and understanding that having, you know, these more processed foods, even ultra processed foods, you know, here and there, or even like somewhat regularly, if you're an endurance athlete and you're having gels and you're having all these, you know, different things, um, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Again, if you take a step back and zoom out and look at the bigger picture, which is always what we want to do, what else are you doing the rest of your days, you know? And so there's that aspect. And then also thinking about, you know, like, are you even meeting your nutrition needs? Because at the end of the day, you can eat all of the whole foods and minimally processed foods that you want. If you are under fueled, chronically Preach. especially <laughs> like like who the hell cares you know you i would so much rather and this is why i talk with my clients i would so much rather you eat something than nothing yep and then at least once we get the something in there and whatever it is we can build on that like again obviously i do not want you having a meal of like chips and nothing else or something like that um or always having fast food but god i'd much rather you do that than like have nothing at all Yes. And we use that as a, as scaffolding, as a stepping stone to then tweak things further and work on improving the quality of what you're eating. And then again, looking at the context and when it makes sense to have these things and when it doesn't. So mm -hmm. there's no easy answer here, but I can tell you what the answer isn't. It's swearing off all processed foods. <laughs> and yeah. sure. The other thing that I, that I see so much, and this is part of what you said about, you know, only eating whatever clean foods, maybe we'll say yeah. that because that's a really yeah. big buzzword yeah. right now is people are eating so much fiber mm. that they, they're filling up on fiber, but they're not filling up on like actual energy. And then that's causing yes. a lot of under fueling, a lot of gut issues, and then they might think, well, oh, it's something in my diet. I have to keep cutting. And so their diet just keeps getting more restrictive. Um, and so oftentimes I'm asking people to add in more of these processed foods, more of the convenience foods, more of the white foods like rice and pastas um, that aren't bean based, that aren't the protein ones, that aren't the high fiber pastas or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just want you to eat the dang, like the dang pasta, like the basic yeah. version. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that's going to be a much more efficient energy source for you than trying to down like three cups of potatoes that are super high fiber that you're not going to be able to get through. Um, so yeah, there's a time and place for everything. And, you know, I, I have conversations all the time of like, stop eating so many fruits and vegetables. <laughs> like, you know, not something I thought I'd say as a dietitian or even something that my clients might think they would hear from a dietitian, but, um, you know, it's like you can you can overdo too much it's like the saying you can yeah. keep too much of a good thing right um and so yeah that's that's kind of where where i'm going with that statement but it's all about again what you're saying the birds eye view and what else are you doing um yeah and you know what i always go back to what's the intention behind it so yeah, um, I, I agree. And it, it's thinking like looking at even like athlete performance plates, like there's a reason mm -hmm. why as you increase your training volume or intensity or whatever's going on, um, you need more carbs. And so like, you know, we're looking at a plate, like there's the quote unquote easy day plate where half your plate is color or fruits and veg and a quarter of the plate is carbs, quarter is, is protein. And then as you increase, like the fruit and veg go down and the carbs go up, right? Yep. So there's a reason for that. It's because you need more carbohydrate. You need more of that energy. Um, it's not to say that like you need to necessarily go for lower fiber carbs or whatever. It really depends on you and what's going on. But typically, you know, I mean, some people have a really good appetite. Some people, especially if they're coming out of a place of being more underfueled and they don't 
they're not in touch with their their hunger and fullness cues or they're kind of struggling with appetite a little bit, it can be really hard to get in enough. Maybe we're mm-hmm. throwing in liquid carbs. Maybe we're throwing in, you know, sports drinks and more sports products. And then again, some of these really easy to eat things like the crackers, like the chips and whatever. Um, it really just depends on the individual. So again, I really want to make sure that I'm addressing this listener's question because even though, you know, this message I received from her seems very simple in a way, it's actually very complicated and it really evokes a lot of discussion. Um, Cause she says, you know, I try hard to avoid those things, you know, meaning like the crackers, the chips and other processed foods. So it's again, my question is, well, I'm curious why you're avoiding those things. And I could bet why you're avoiding those things is because she probably thinks they're bad for her and that she's not supposed to have them or that she'll gain weight. Or, I mean, those are the typical things we hear, right? Like I, yeah. I honestly don't know what this person mm-hmm. was indicating there, but those would be my best guesses. And so I, I, I'd, I'd encourage her to, you know, maybe explore that, you know, why are you trying not to, you know, have those things? Um, and, you know, she says she tries to make like basically stuff for her drop bags as simple as healthy as possible. So I'm assuming this person's an endurance athlete. If she's doing drop bags, that's great. If you want to make the foods in your drop bags simple and healthy, like great. If that works for you, awesome. It doesn't work for everybody. And Mm -hmm. again, so, so like with kind of the organic discussion and all that, like this all comes back down to what works for you. There are some people out there that can tolerate all kinds of different things and you know they're eating more you know solid foods and real foods and all kinds of stuff and then there are other people that just can't do that necessarily and they do need the convenience items so um, or maybe they just prefer the taste or maybe that's what works for them in that moment of their uh, you know ultra run or whatever is going on so I think you know the top message here is is yeah zoom out there's a place for everything Um, and there's no need to swear off all things. And I would say, and I know you basically said this as well, when you're referring to like binging and all that stuff, it's like, if you are not letting yourself have something and you're not letting it be in the house or you find it too hard to control yourself, like that in itself should be a red flag that something's off. Um, and that you're kind of demonizing these foods so much that you can't have, you, maybe you can't control yourself around them or, you know, you have a very unhealthy relationship with these foods and we would instead promote working on neutralizing that and trying to kind of take a step back. And again, this is asking a lot. Some people just aren't going to get there. There will always be people who are like, all ultra processed foods are terrible and you shouldn't. And I'm not going to sit here and deny that. Like, obviously there are problems with people over consuming them and, and, you know, having all these health issues and everything. But, um, but that doesn't mean that we have to like demonize them entirely. Right. It's like, it's again, the black and white thinking, right? It's, yes. There, yes. there is room for the gray area and it, it is very frustrating. Um, sometimes when, when I, you know, people would like judge others for their food, food habits, or, you know, even as a dietitian, we get judged all the time. This is a perfect mm-hmm. example for us. Oh my gosh. I meet a lot of new people all the time, again, because of our lifestyle. Um, we're always, you know, in a new location and people are like, oh, you're a dietitian. I'm going to look at your plate. And I'm like, it, it doesn't <laughs> matter what's on my plate. I know. I know. <laughs> like, it doesn't totally. matter. And I'm like, yeah. oh, well, like the other day I went and I grabbed, um, I grabbed a cookie before I had dinner. I was at a, you know, a mom's night out or whatever. And they're like, oh, Brooke grabbed a cookie. So I guess we can all have a cookie now. And I'm like, no, see, that's not the point here. Like. I, I grabbed the cookie because I wanted it. Do I always have a cookie before dinner? No, but like I wanted the cookie. So I grabbed the cookie and that's it. That's it. That's yeah. all that happened. Um, yeah. So it didn't make me good. It didn't make me bad. It just, I just ate a cookie. Um, so it can be that simple, <laughs> yeah, but it's so not, it's so, not, I know, you know, I know. And I, it's so hard to like, you know, sit here and like generalize things and like try to make things simple and, but it's so, it is complicated. It is, it is complex. Um, but that's why I love being a dietitian. Cause I could talk about, sit here and talk about the gray area and the nuance all day. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so to kind of wrap up, I think this listener was wanting recommendations. Um, hopefully we answered the organic part and just basically like, don't worry too much about it. <laughs> um, and then in terms of like, well, because she, I think she was what she might have been getting. I mean, I, I might be interpreting this wrong, but I think what she was getting at is what are some 
less processed options for um for endurance running um and and again like if this works for you if you like to have the dates if you like to have you know there are some more real food based sports products out there if you like to have i mean you certainly could you know, make your own like rice balls and make your mm-hmm. own granola bars. And like, you can do all kinds of people make their own gels. People do like sweet potato. I mean, people do all kinds of stuff, yeah. but, and I don't know what she's training for or what the context is. I will say though, like, as we point, like if there's too much fiber going on and even too much <laughs> fruit with fructose, yeah. you're going to poop, man. Like you're going to poop more <laughs> we don't want all that poop. Um, so, you know, we, again, we just have to think, practically logistically like can the food even keep like there's just lots of things to think about like is a pb and j considered too processed for you like you know is that quote unquote real food or is that still ultra pro- you know, like i wouldn't define that as ultra processed but some people so, might you know so again like this is where it gets super tricky and at the end of the day like just see what works for you and experiment and yeah, that's kind of where I'd go. I, I mean, maybe I'm not giving her what she wants, which is like a list of all these foods that you can go to. I certainly have given so many. I mean, I have like handouts. I have things that are both free and low cost on my website that, you know, people can look at. But, um, you know, I don't know. There are a lot of there. I mean, you can go online anywhere and find like examples of popular running, ultra running, you know, foods and look at any aid station and and I am on board with any of those options as long as they have carbs and you're getting your salts in and you're getting your fluids and you're not overdoing the fat, you're getting a little protein in, you know, like there's a lot of ways we can go with it. There's no one right way. Yes. As long as it suits your needs. Fabulous. Uh, yes. I once had a client tell me that they were sick of spending all this time in the kitchen to make these quote unquote good foods and low processed foods that mm-hmm. they're burning out. And I was like, well, then that's not working for you. And that's something that you don't have to do that in order to be healthy. Yeah. In order to be good, you know, like mm-hmm. you, you don't have to do that. It's okay to do the convenience option more than okay. If you, if you want to do the convenience option, um, it doesn't make you, you know, a, a better steward of health. If you're making your own mayonnaise or making your own mashed potatoes for your, you know, your event. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it's not. Yeah. So. yeah. And, and, and that, you know, like, I really want to highlight that whole thing. And you mentioned it earlier, but like, you are not a better morally superior person um, just because you quote unquote, like eat clean or avoid processed foods or go organic or whatever it is. Like people really kind of hold on to these things. And I mean, you know how it is with nutrition. Nutrition Mm -hmm. is often a religion for many people, you know, whatever approach, lifestyle, diet, whatever. I mean, they really get very preachy about it and really you know, they, and Hey, they find community and it's like a whole thing. Right. And, um, I'm all for community and everything, but people get really, really worked up <laughs> about things. And, um, you know, it's okay. It's okay. If you eat conventional stuff, if you eat processed foods, like I promise it's okay. Like you, not that you don't need our permission, please. Like you don't obviously, but we're saying it's okay. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Okay. So again, we might, we might circle back to some of these things, but I want before too much time passes, um, cause it's, we're coming up in an hour here. Let's tackle GMOs. So, um, let's just as we have with the other things, um, again, listener didn't ask about this, but it's so relevant to this, you know, I feel like you can't not talk about it. So, um, can you define what GMOs are, um, and what the research says about their safety? GMOs. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm pulling up my notes again, because there are five, I want to say, I think I'm remembering five different types of GMOs. And so at the very like basis of this conversation, a GMO is something that's been genetically modified to create an altered product. And whether that be, it was for, um, to make it more pest resistant so that less pests would eat into the crop. Or maybe it's going to help the product grow in harsher conditions. Um, these are all examples of GMOs and how they are used. Um, so yes, there are different five different types: traditional breeding, mutagenesis, RNA interference, transgenesis, and gene editing. So all of those are considered G- 
GMO, genetically modified. Um, traditional breeding and mutagenesis are not considered like GMO. So they can pass the GMO sticker stamp. Um, all of the other ones, the RNA interference, the transgenesis and the gene editing, they would be considered a GMO. And so that product, if it was made with either of those processes, would not have the GMO sticker on it. At the end of the day, how I like to think about this is that most of what we consume is modified in some way, genetically modified in some way. Um, and that's not a bad thing. So it's, again, a very nuanced conversation, but I... I completely disregard the GMO stamp. It, it's to me, it has zero relevance. Um, in fact, I actually, I, I'm happy to have a GMO food. And there has been decades of research at this point to tell us that consuming GMO products are extremely safe for our health. They don't pose any health risk. Um, and I think you know that's really the main message there is that the research has proven to us time and time again that they are not harmful to our health. Um, and in fact, I think they are a very, they're, they're a net positive to our population because we can continue to feed our population more efficiently and more effectively. And I think that that's something we can probably all get behind. Um, as why are people, way. why are people so against GMOs? I'm, I really feel like it's the GMO project, like the, the GMO project stamp and the okay. messaging that they've, the marketing that they have spread throughout, you know, our time of like, if something's produced in a lab, it means it's bad really is is the the basis of the of the argument um but that doesn't mean that it's bad at all in fact it could be a really really great thing but if you don't want to eat food that's produced in a lab okay great <laughs> well but like if the food itself is not produced in a lab i mean isn't it just like the seeds or like again this is something i will confess i don't know a ton about um i have not done a ton of research on it but uh like like like, what are the, are there actual, like, health, like, what are they point, like, what's the argument against GMO? Like, that's what I'm, I'm confused. Why people are freaking out so much about GMOs. <laughs> no, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's that's a, literally it. Yes. It's, it's a very, um, it's a pointless, like, label. It's a pointless, I don't want to say it's a pointless argument because that would invalidate a lot of people. But I just, yes. I just, it's not relevant to our health. It's not relevant to anything that goes on in our body. Like it's just one of those things that like, it's just been modified in some way to be different. Um, and whether that's like, what about like, like pluots? Oh, that's different. That's not genetically modified, right? That's like cross bread. No, that's, no, that's considered GMO. It's genetically it is. modified. Yeah. So when, when two things are kind of bred together to create a different product that is also yes. a GMO. Okay. That's a GMO. Mm -hmm. I love pluots. Pluots are great. <laughs> what is that? It's like a that. it's an apricot plum. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is um that's a GMO. Mm -hmm. Is it is it with soybeans and corn? Is that that's like the main discussion, right? Yes. Is, isn't that the main GMO thing? Can we talk about that for a second? Again, oh, I should have okay. done my research before this podcast episode and I, I apologize to my listeners. I am not up to date on this i will have to do no. this afterwards it's it's soybeans it's corn it's cotton, cotton um yeah, that's right sugar like beets and sugar cane uh those are like the big gmo producers corn is really the big one and again this is kind of something that we would talk about on the farm all the time going back to the farm days um if you are somebody in a and again, I'm not talking about corn syrup and things like that, but like I'm using the example of sweet corn, for example, mm -hmm. sweet corn is a GMO. And thank God we have those as GMOs, because if you tried to eat into like a traditional, whatever, the non gmo corn, it would taste like junk. One, the taste would not taste good. And secondly, it's like you would break your tooth trying to bite into it. Like, so things have been bred to have different tastes, have different textures, have different sweetnesses. And so we would, we would try different types of sweet corn seeds all the time. And like, none of it is bad. Um, it's just been modified to, you know, have a different taste or a different growth pattern, or again, protect it from different pests. So, you know, it's just, the conversation is so broad with GMOs, because like you said, it could be a, you know, a plum cod or whatever it is, and then we could talk about something else that's been genetically modified, like uh, your impossible burger patties. Like, 
you know, all of those are genetically modified in very different ways, right? So it's just so wait, Impossible Burger is considered genetically modified, like, in my opinion, or just because it's a it's been produced in a lab. Interesting. So I thought that I was more of like go... an engineered food. So I want you to go to the. I need. I need. To, okay, GMO... I need to research this. I'm so sorry. I, I did not. This is where I did not look. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is good. This is why you bring on different people. Like, so mm. I want you to go to the GMO Project website. I've heard of GMO read, Project. Yeah. And just read what they consider to be a GMO. Because their yeah. definition okay. is that it's something that's produced in a lab. Got it. Okay. But at the, okay. Like, well, that I, is okay. a very different. It's broad. It's very broad. It's a very different topic than GMO in general. So. Yeah. Okay. Got it. But like, okay. Produced in a lab. Well, food science, like food scientists produce like protein bars and like energy bar. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're engineered foods. Like go, again, we're linking this back to sports nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's like food science stuff. Like people mm -hmm. are creating that and like, I mean, a kitchen, a lab, I guess you can differentiate between one and the other. Um, but that's okay. That's interesting. So like when you say that, their definition of being created a lab is different from GMO generally. Can you clarify that? What do you mean by that? So when I, when I had talked about at the very beginning, the traditional breeding and the mutagenesis, mm -hmm. those are like what we're talking about when we're, when we're referring to, um, and in pot potentially genetic too, and we're talking about different crops and different produce and how like those are produced, those are not considered GMO, but something like RNA interference and transgenesis those things are mm -hmm. highly regulated. Those things are going to ha potentially have the, um, like the GMO label. So the other thing that, the other thing that I, that I wanted to clarify too, is that there's this new label on food products that is talking about bioengineering and made with bioengineered products, mm -hmm. which is essentially supposed to be the opposite of GMO. So what is, I don't know if okay, bioengineering, can you define that for, for my listeners? So uh, more things about bioengineered in a lab. Um, let me just Google it really quick. So something produced in a lab is going to be bioengineering label. Let me look at that. If you go downstairs or wherever your food, my food is downstairs after mm -hmm. this podcast, and you look at certain labels, you might see that things are produced with uh, bioengineered products, bioengineering label. So bioengineered bio food as a label contains a bioengineered food ingredient um, for marketing purposes do not convey any information about the health safety or environmental attributes of the food compared to its non bioengineered counterpart so highly refined ingredients this is right from the USDA website highly refined ingredients in foods that are primarily meat poultry and products do not require a bioengineered food disclosure um, let's see. Bioengineered foods typically are genetically modified organisms. Congress used the term BE when they passed the National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard. So, so I guess, I mean, what, what are the take, what's the takeaway here? I mean, the takeaway I'm, I'm getting from GMO, because I have like a, you know, basic understanding of GMO is that you're saying this is an overall positive thing we shouldn't stress about GMO. We also know that GMO is under the organic label. So that kind of is tied into that whole discussion. Um, what's the takeaway with this bioengineered business? It, it literally, in my opinion, it, it means little to nothing on the food label. Like it's not okay. something that we need to be concerned with. It's not something that if you see it on the label, doesn't mean that you can consume it it's very, again, it's very nuanced. There's so many loopholes to it. And it just means that it's been bioengineered in some way in a lab, genetically modified in some way. So mm -hmm. it, that's why it's so confusing because you have the GMO label, you have the bioengineered label, and they both mean slightly different things, but at the same time, like it doesn't mean anything. So yeah. it's, yeah. it's very like, it's one of those things that I completely disregard. It's something that is a complete marketing sham in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and if you, I don't know how many of you guys listening are on Instagram, but if you guys follow food science, babe on Instagram, 
she has a wealth of information. Um, she has amazing like highlights in her story about GMOs, about organic foods, about um, glyphosate, like all these heavy hitters, food dyes, things like that. She is a literal food scientist and she breaks down everything on her page into very like digestible, consumable information. So highly recommend following her for like any of your regulatory questions on food. Um, I like, um, is it unbiased science? Yeah, that one's, good too. that one's good too. That has some good, not everything like it kind of goes again or, or talks about all of the, the fear surrounding like certain chemicals or, you know, sometimes it's like the, you know, the dirty dozen or the pesticides or whatever it is. Um, so that sometimes goes into food stuff and it's not always food related, but, mm -hmm. um, okay. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think we've covered a lot. Hopefully, um, I, I'm not sure if uh, the listener liked our answer. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously irrelevant. Um, but I, I hope I hope I did it justice and answered some of those questions, or at least got out. Like again, I really I thought it was a, a great prompt for a discussion around this topic that I haven't covered on the podcast yet. Um, and for me, the takeaway really is as we've talked about several times already, at the end of the day, you can choose to eat whatever you want, organic, processed, unprocessed, GMO or not. Um, whatever it is that you want to eat, as long as it works for you, as long as it works for your budget, um, you know, and we don't want it to stress you out. You know, we know that, you know, food stress is also not good for your health. Um, so I really encourage you to take a step back, zoom out, look at the big picture, pay attention to the why behind things. You know, if you have very strong beliefs about food, you really should investigate where those are stemming from. I think you, you talked about like the intention, you know, so like, like what, where are these things coming from? Is it coming from a random, you know, post you read online? Is it coming from your long held beliefs? Is it coming from a family member who just said something was bad? Like, like just, you know, is it coming from marketing? Messaging? Like just pay attention to where these things are stemming from. I think it's good always to challenge certain beliefs. Um, and, you know, and, and I encourage you to listen to other people and, and see what they have to say about this topic. We're certainly not, you know, the only people talking about it, but just always ask questions. I think it's a good idea and not just accept everything at face value, especially when someone's running around saying everything's bad. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's kind of my, my conclusion. Do you have anything else that you want to add to this discussion? No, I don't think so. Um, I know a lot of what I said was really like confusing, probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was weird. good. Um, so, you know, I think at the end of the day, my, my big message too is like, if you're worried about where your food comes from and how, like, you know, go to a local farm, visit a local farm if you can, I think you would learn so much. Um, I know I do every time I go and that really will give you, I think, a different different perspective and help you decide how you want to make your food choices from there on out. Um, that's really my big message too. Awesome. Awesome. Um, all right. We're going to go through my quick bites questions and I'll let you get back to it. Uh, what is your favorite post-workout meal or snack? Hmm. It's always an easy one. I, well, for a meal, I would do a bagel sandwich with eggs and bacon and cheese um, for a snack, it'd be fair life chocolate milk. Love me some chocolate. Milk. Oh yes. Same. What has been your kind of worst, uh, race or any kind of workout nutrition experience since you were a long time athlete? Oh. <laughs> um, I took, I, I did not take my own advice and I tried a new fuel on race day. Um, I love honey stinger gels and I thought that the plain honey stinger would just be honey did not taste anything like plain honey. And I could not even scarf it down. Like I was at mile eight of my half marathon. That was the only fuel that I had brought along with me. And then I hit a major wall at mile 10 and you know, it just had the GI upset. I had everything going on. So it was just mm -hmm. not fun. <laughs> I can't, I can't with honey stingers. They're just so sweet. Like for me personally, I just, I don't know. <laughs> I just can't. It's it's just again. It's so funny. This is where it comes back to like some people love something, some people hate it, and it's just yeah. so funny to me because I just I can't get that stuff. <laughs> but I know people love that stuff, so more power to you if you can get through that. Uh, all right, biggest cooking catastrophe if you've had one. 
probably the other day, actually. Um, I'm, I've had a lot. My husband does most of the cooking, which is funny because everyone's like, you're a dietitian. You don't cook. No, I hate cooking. Yeah, um, same. The other day there was too much like charcoal built up underneath our electric stove. And I was trying to boil a pot of water and start a fire. So that was good. I mean, it was fine. Like we did not have to call the fire department or anything, but the flames were big enough that I was concerned. Um, so that Yikes. would be my cooking <laughs> Yeah. We never like to burn down the, the house. That's always good. <laughs> uh, what is the most exotic or interesting food that you've ever tried? I was not prepared for this question. Um, Hmm. No, it'd probably be some, I'm sure I've tried something way more weird than this, but probably just an exotic fruit, I guess, from when we were in Hawaii, we went and tried a whole bunch of this exotic fruits. I can't remember what they were, but that's probably the most crazy thing I've tried. I'm a very diverse eater though. So I'm good to try anything. I would, I would try like, you know, cow tongue or whatever. I haven't had the opportunity to do that before, but I would, if I could. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I always, like, I've seen, like, cow tongue, like, on display and, like, a butcher. Thing. It's just, it's, like, so, I don't know. It's, like, gray and weird or something. I just can't. I can't. It makes me think of my grandma. She's like, ooh, yum, tongue sandwiches are the best. I'm like, that's, like, literally it makes my skin crawl. But, you know, hey, I don't want to yuck anyone's yum. So, you know, more power to people who love cow tongue. Uh, I'm sure it's chock full of nutrients. Uh, how do you like your eggs cooked? Um, over, over easy. What is your favorite beverage? Just I know, water. Just water. I just like water. I mean, I drink coffee every day, but water is my consistent, my tried and true. What are your comfort foods? Sorry, what was the last question? What are your comfort foods? Mac and cheese, for sure. Um, and this is funny because our conversation about organic versus conventional. Um, I was eating Annie's for a long time. And the, just the other day, I was like, you know what? I'm going to try Kraft. Kraft is the superior box mac and cheese. Let me just say, so much better. So I just think that's funny because Annie's is like the organic, the non-GMO yeah, yeah. product, whatever. Kraft is like the complete opposite and it's way better. So taste-wise, at least for me. It's, you know, it's funny because it reminds me the other day, last weekend, we were at a, a like a kid's pool party and she had like Annie's... Um, fruit snacks and annie's like i guess it's kind of like fruit by the foot i don't know if yeah. you ever had that growing up fruit by the foot but it was an annie's version and i was like oh it's like fruit by the foot she's like oh yeah but it's annie's version and, and she kind of like said it jokingly like knowing it did. and i'm like it literally doesn't make <laughs> these are basically the same it's like it's like buying like the organic jelly beans or like the organic yes. gum- first of all not only do they taste disgusting but Actually, the Annie stuff's good, to be fair. They're, they're gummy, they're gummy, whatever was fine. But like, it's just, again, it's just like, it's such a marketing thing. Like, it's still sugar, guys. Like, right, right. It's still whatever. a box mac and cheese. <laughs> Anywho. Um, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? Um, cookie dough. And last question, top three items of gear that are most essential to your active lifestyle? My soft flight flasks, for sure. My 15 ounces my vest and probably my sunglasses. Good answers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brooke. This is a really great discussion. I really appreciate your time and your knowledge. Where can everyone find you if they want to reach out and give you a follow? Yeah. So Instagram is the best way to find me at intentful nutrition. I N T E N T F U L nutrition. Uh, my web my website is www.intentfulnutrition.com and I do have a podcast that Claire was on fairly Yay! recently, uh, <laughs> the Actively Fueled Podcast. So that is three places. Beautiful. Love it. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Can't wait to get this episode out. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's our show for today. I hope you all enjoyed my chat with Brooke. And if you did, please make sure you hit follow or subscribe wherever you listen. And again, as I asked earlier, if you have a minute, I would be so grateful if you could give me a five-star rating and also write a review. If you could share it with your friends, whatever you can do to kind of help this show grow. If you're able to support the show financially, I do have a Patreon page. I'd love to see you in my community. Um, for just $6 a month, you get you know free merchandise, you get 
discounts on my digital goods. You get all kinds of other perks. Um, and I'd really love to grow that community so we can do more with it right now. It's relatively small, um, but it is growing and I'd really love your support there. Thank you so much as always for listening. And again, if you'd like to reach out Claire at eFordNerds.com, I would love to hear from you and I hope you have a great day until next time.